Hi folks, it's Di again. Got me take another slam off the old coffee cup, didn't you? <laughs> okay, let's keep moving on this um, video series on live or die living off the land. Okay, now we're going to get into the meat of things. I, um, you'll see me glancing here at my, um, laptop once in a while because I've got some notes on it um, that help me keep on point, hopefully. It's, it's hard for me to keep on point sometimes. Um, but what we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about some of the hard facts on surviving and living off the land when things go bad. What I'm going to talk about are some of the failures historically and some of the examples, or I should say some of the lessons that we should learn and I have taken a lot of these lessons to heart and practiced them in my outdoor activities um, and share them with others. But these are some lessons we really need to take to heart and take serious because unfortunately for others, they failed. Fortunately for us, we can learn from their failures. Now, I'm a person that I, I, I use the term fail and I don't like to. I, I have clientele that I assist in bushcrafting skills. Um, when I teach bushcrafting skills to people, I always tell them it's not how you succeed, it's just the fact that you will succeed that matters. Because you don't succeed as well as someone else, that does not mean you failed. Um, we all, I, I've said it in some other videos, I, 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 I love challenges like the five minute fire or the one minute fire or the five minute shelter, you know, setting up challenges. What it does is it just, it stimulates a person to do the best they can. Now, if you can't get a fire going in five minutes, but you can get it going in 10, nobody, no one should ever say, well, you failed. You couldn't get a fire going in five minutes. That is not a failure. That's a success. You successful, successfully started a fire. That was the goal. Can you get to that goal in a reasonable amount of time? Whatever it is you're doing. And be good at it. Well, then you're a success. Because you can't make a five minute fire like somebody else. You can't take a flint and steel and whack whack and boom, get a bird's nest going and you got a fire going and you might have two minutes involved. You can't do that, but you can do it in eight minutes. You are just success as successful as the person that did it in two minutes. They are no more successful than you were. They were just faster. I don't mind competing for the fun of it. Sometimes I come out ahead, sometimes I come out behind, but I never fail. Now, if something doesn't go the way it should, and let's say you're trying to start a fire, there's another good, back to the fire starting. 
and you're, the method you're using, you try and you try and you try and you try and you cannot get that fire to go. And you say, well, <laughs> I can't get that method to work. So you try another method and boom, you got a fire going. Now you're sitting around that nice fire you got finally got going and people around you, if you got people around you, may say, well, you sure failed at doing that with a flint and steel. You, you didn't do it. You, you failed at using the hand drill. You failed at using the bow drill. But boy, you got a fire going once you pulled that cigarette lighter out, didn't you? But you failed all them other times. Now, personally, I say that is not a failure because now you sit and you reflect on what you did and how you did it. And it's was a learning experience. It was not a failure. You still got the product you needed and that was a fire. You found a method that would produce the fire. Now, if you were to never be able to get the fire going at all, now that's a concern. Now you obviously failed, but take that to your advantage and say, why did I fail? Well, it's because I don't have the skill set. That's simple enough. Um, so you learn from that. And what I do is I stress to people, you may not be as successful as you wish. So improve upon it and take those times that you weren't fully ex successful and look on them as learning process, learning experience, Look at what went wrong. Now you know, I'm not going back there. I'm not doing that again, because that doesn't work. That's being a successful person. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some people that the word failure actually, to me personally, fits. To me, failure is that is the end of the road. Failure is when you could not accomplish what you needed to do to survive, to sustain yourself and survive. That is failing. When you can no longer continue to live because of your inabilities, not because an outside cause of death, but a cause of death that was created by your inabilities. That's when, sadly enough, you have failed. So let's get onto the living off the land and some examples. Well, we're going to start with survival first. <clears throat> now, I discussed it in the earlier video. Um, survival versus living off the land. Um, surviving off the land, living off the land. People think they're, they're synonymous. They, they, don't, they mean the same thing. And to me personally, no, they do not. To survive off the land, um, you're going to take items off the land and you're going to construct a shelter. You're going to start a fire using things off the land. Um, if you don't have a container with you, you're going to use something off the land to pr produce a container. Uh, all the five C's you're going to try to generate off the land, right? If you think of survival as what it really is for. Survival is to get through something to an end. It's not continuous. To survive is to get by for another day, another week, another month, but with the full intention to come for that to come to an end. And to be rescued and or to rescue yourself from a situation. Now, 
in a survival situation, and I discussed in an earlier video, you can survive for weeks without food. So if you're in a situation where you're going to be in a survival scenario, I would say for more than a week, you need to be concerned. If you're going to be in that situation and you can reasonably say, I'm probably not going to be rescued for a month, you better be very concerned. If you don't know when you're going to be rescued, you can't even see that far out, but you still, your intent is still to be rescued. You better quit being concerned. You better quit being very concerned and you better start taking action. Okay. Now I'm going to give an example of, you, you need to be prepared in the event of a, of a survival scenario where you're going to have to depend on resources off the land. And many of you know this example. And this example goes back um, to early uh, April of 1846, um, the Donner Party. Now, those of you that don't know the Donner Party story, um, George Donner and a bro his brother um, had their families um, and they were moving to California and they were um, crossing what is known today um, as Donner's Pass. Um, what happened and they had their families and, and they're pioneers. They're moving out west, moving to California. And what happened was, is they were crossing the mountains and they were running way too late in the season. And they got trapped up in the mountains and um, got hit by a severe um, snow snowstorm. Um, um, and it was one of the most brutal snowstorms in history in those mountains. And um, the problem was they got stuck up there. They didn't know what to do. And they had to, so they figured, we'll just hold up here and we'll wait this out. And well, they were, they were stuck up there for five months, okay? Now, can you imagine a five month survival scenario? That is a long time to take that as a survival scenario. Now, I don't believe that that's what they really intended to stay there five months. I, I, I believe they were hoping that that weather would have um, broke and they would have been able to get out, um, that they, did not expect to be stuck for five months. Uh, they had very little food or supplies because they intended on getting over the mountain down to California and they'd be all right, everything'd be good. So they didn't need all those supplies and food. And well, they made makeshift cabins and tents and things that they, um, that they were gonna live in for those five months um, that they were stuck up there. And Things did not go well, and they did not get rescued um, until, um, well, it was um, early in 19, or 1847. Um, they got caught up in the mountains yeah, in the fall, late fall, and they were stuck there for five months over the winter until... Um, very early in 1847. And the problem was, is they, they didn't, um, they weren't prepared for it. They didn't know how to survive it. They ran out of food. 
totally out of food. They couldn't find food. They, they did try. They tried to hunt and gather, but they couldn't find enough food. I mean, they got to the point where they were boiling the hides. They, they killed the livestock, well, which were their horses. Um, they killed the livestock that was pulling their wagons. They ate those. They used the hides to make shelters. They got to the point where they were breaking apart the bones of those animals and eating the marrow out of the bones. They got to the point where um, they actually took the hides from their shelters, the roofs of their cabins and the, the tents, and cut the hides up and put them in a pot and boiled them into a slurry and ate that to survive. And even that didn't work. It wasn't enough. They ended up resorting to cannibalism to survive that five months. Terrible, terrible scenario. Um, the, <clears throat> there's some things that kind of <coughs> surprised me when looking at the history of the Donner Party and what really took place um, that tells you some of the mistakes they really made. Well, first of all, in my opinion, the first mistake they made was they treated it as a survival situation and we just need to hold out a while and we'll either get rescued or we'll find a way out. Now that would have been all right if they would have applied themselves immediately to rescue, okay? But they didn't. They, hold, they, they held up in this little valley in the, up in the mountain, uh, on the mountain built themselves these shelters, and they kind of settled in. It's like, we'll wait for an answer. They let their minds relax and not concern themselves with the immediacy of their situation. While they still had horses they could butcher for food, they should have taken the healthiest of their group, which there was a... Um, there were many in their group. Um, there was, um, oh, I, I, I don't remember the total number, but um, I would have to look it up here. But um, there were 81 of them, 81 of them, and only 45 managed to walk out of that situation alive. Now, out of 81 of them, they should have taken half a dozen of their healthiest individuals supplied them with as much food as they could carry and the needed bushcrafting items for their track and sent those people out for rescue. Now they had proven because some people had actually hiked out um, I'm going to take a look at my notes here to see um, if I can tell you how many hiked out. Um, okay, here it is. Um, oops. Um, okay. Oh, well, here's a point that's important too. The majority of their group, their party, were children. Over half of them were children. Um, but they sent out, they waited a, more than a month after they got snowed in. And that was December 16th, all right? So that means they were snowed in in early November. And they waited till December 16th. And they sent 15 of their strongest members of their group. They made homemade snowshoes and they tried to walk out of the mountains to find help. Okay, they wandered around for several days and they, because they did not know where they were going, couldn't find their way out, they resorted to cannibalism 
um, and got to the point where they were even willing to kill one or one and another for food. Um, they, through cannibalism, had enough energy um, to spend a month of hiking around, trying to find their way out. Seven of the original 15 people made it to a ranch in California and helped organize rescue efforts um, to get the rest of the people off the mountain. I'm not going, in and going to go into all the details of how they were cannibalizing each other. Um, it's just bad enough that they had to resort to that. Um, but what I want to take on this is um, the fact that um, that nearly half of those people never made it off that mountain. Um, there's a lot to be said for what led the Donner Party to its demise. And here's my take on it. They were ill-informed about the potential conditions they could run into on that mountain. They were, were warned that there were snowstorms at that time of the year on the pass and that they were running way too late and that they should stay on the eastern side of the mountains until spring. But they decided to take off anyway against advice. Big mistake, very big mistake. Again, not taking the advice of those who know. Another thing that they didn't do is make sure they were properly supplied in the event of something catastrophic. Another thing that was an issue was they were skilled farmers, okay? Um, these folks um, came from Springfield, Illinois, I believe it was. Um, the the um yeah they were fr from springfield illinois and um they had a farming background so they they had a lot of um mechanical skills they they could bush craft things they would should have had no problem crafting items they needed they proved that when they made makeshift homemade snowshoes for some of their people to go out and try to um, secure help. Um, but what they lacked were the true pioneer skills necessary in the sense of survival. Um, their frame of mind and their their skill set was that of agricultural farming. That does not get you there in a wilderness survival, live off the land scenario. So they did not have the knowledge of what they would be going into. They did not have the knowledge of what to do once they got there and got themselves in that situation. And they did the best their skill set and their mindset would allow them to do. But because of a lot of lackings, areas they lacked in, and I've read some detail in some of the parts of the account of how some of them lost their minds. I mean, they were virtually had, some of them had gotten to the point of insanity. Um, 
And it all comes down to they were in a place in the wrong time. There were no resources. They were not going to survive on that mountain for long. When they had the resources, they did not make the greatest effort to get themselves out. Now, getting yourself out in a group situation like that would have been to send those um, party members out to get help um, as they did. Um, they, they, um, you know, they sent 15 people out, but they waited for more than a month to do it. They should have done that in the first week. And they probably would have been rescued much sooner, much sooner. And the thing is, is they let, they were up there so long that by the time rescuers, um, actually started the process of re uh, rescuing them. It took over two months. Um, let's see what my notes here. Um, the, oh boy, they couldn't get pack animals into them. So they had to go in by foot and the first um, search or relief parties, rescue parties reached the settlers in February and they could only bring what food and supplies they could carry on their backs. Okay. <clears throat> and so many of the folks they were rescuing were so weak, they died on the way out. And they sent four relief teams, four rescue teams up there over a two and a half month period. And they finally got them all out. Um, very extreme, very unusual, but very much so avoidable. It's a terrible, terrible failure in living off the land. They found out the land was not going to feed them throughout the winter in the Sierra Nevadas. Now in the summer, that area is full of game animals. There's creeks and rivers with um, fish in them. There's a lot of wild edibles all over. But in the winter, there's nothing. And they were not prepared for it. And it came back to bite them. And it bit them bad. Okay, so there's my first example of survival off the land. Sometimes survival off the land is just not going to work. You have to keep in mind, survival is short period. They went five months. Five months is not survival. So five months is living. They needed to know how to live for those five months to make it to spring. Instead, they tried to survive for five months and they ended up eating each other. Terrible, terrible situation, um, and a and a huge survival failure. Okay, my next example um, for those of you that know, I, I I guess I haven't met anybody that doesn't know the story of Chris McCandless. Um, my viewers from Alaska, <laughs> you you gotta know Chris. Um, this situation actually happened in um, Alaska um, with Chris. Um, he, <laughs> he was a young man uh, in his 20s, uh, his early mid-20s. Um, this um, happened, this situation with Chris happened back in 1992 and um, he, he was just, just on the edge of the Denali National Park up in Alaska, um, living in an old school bus, and he was found dead in that school bus. And there was a lot of controversy over the whole story. Um, 
And that area, the, the, the old bus has always been treated as um, an emergency shelter for trappers and hikers and tr um, hunters, you know, folks in that area. If they got stranded out there, they could always stay in that bus for a few days and then get out. Um, but McCandless went up there, Chris went up there to survive. Well, not, not really survive, to live. He wanted to live off the land. He was an odd character in a sense. Um, and he wanted to go up there and get closer to nature and live off the land. Well, the land got the best of him. Um, he did well He when he first started out. He did fairly well. Um, he... Um, he kept a journal, a diary, um, and some of his entries in the diary eventually led to a conclusive reason why he passed away while out there in the Canadian backcountry. Um, at first, and for many years, it was just a given. He, he died from starvation. That's what killed Chris was starvation. Now, the fact that the general consensus was is that Chris had perished from starvation um, was generally accepted. Now, of course, a lot of people said, well, you know, okay, the autopsy showed that he um, succumbed to um, starvation. That's, that's what the result of the autopsy was. Um, but of course, people said, no, no, no. He died because he was stupid. He died because he shouldn't have been out there in the first place. Some people he went so far as to say, well, he committed suicide by going out there and starving himself to death intentionally. Well, the one thing is, is Chris had kept a journal diary and he, he kept, he wrote down what was going on while he was there. And one thing we do know is that after spending about three months on a marginal diet that included squirrels, porcupines, small birds, mushrooms, roots, and berries. He had, he had such a caloric deficit that he was right on the edge of becoming so weak that he would definitely um, be leading to starvation. You have to take in enough calories to maintain yourself because if you don't, you just start, your body starts using its fats and its proteins to survive. And eventually, in a sense, you have eaten yourself to death. Um, and also through his writings, they found that he had consumed some items that were very detrimental to him. Well, I should say in item, he, there was one specific item. And after, it took many, many, many years before they finally had the science to do the testing and come up with a conclusion as to why did he starve to death? Now it's not for lack of going out and gathering and hunting because Chris actually did. Now, as I said, he spent three months on a marginal diet 
of squirrels, porcupines, small birds, mushrooms, roots, and berries. Those are all good items. Those are all good items. Now, when we get into a future video down the, down the series here, I'll be talking about wild edibles and their caloric values. You'll be amazed. And I will be talking back about Chris McCandless and his marginal diet. And we'll look at how many squirrels, porcupines, small birds, mushrooms, roots, and berries he would have had to have eaten during those three months to maintain his body weight. And let's, and we'll look at that, and we'll look at how he starved to death if you're on a marginal diet of those things. And they mean marginal because he was right on the edge, right at the brink of starvation. Now, I, I can see a person doing that for a couple of months and then getting the heck out of there. And everybody says, it was clear that his intention was to come out of there for the winter. He was not going to spend the winter in there. So what happened? Well, after they did the science and they looked at his journal and found something unusual, they were able to come up with a conclusion why he ended up starving. Now, this is a quote from Chris McCandless out of his diary, out of his journal. It says, extremely weak, fault of potato seed, much trouble just to stand up, starving, great jeopardy, end of quote. So I'm gonna just say that once more real quick. Extremely weak, fault of potato seed, much trouble just to stand up, starving, great jeopardy. Okay, now, he, he, um, one of the roots he was eating was a wild potato, very common, wild potato. But he extend, he, he, to add to his diet, to have more to eat, he started harvesting the potato seeds because if the plants were maturing and the seeds were there, he started harvesting the seeds. The seeds are easy to harvest. Um, there is the writer of um, Into the Wild, he, did, he, he went out there and did an experiment and he picked, I, I can't remember what it was, um, I think it was a pound of wild seed in a half an hour um, of potato seed. It was not that difficult. Um, so we know McCandless was harvesting and eating potato seeds. Well, several people looked into it and found that there's a toxic agent um, that is an amino acid that is in potato, the wild potato seed. Now, it's a compound commonly referred to as beta ODAP, capital O-D-A-P, beta ODAP. But we'll just call it ODAP, okay? Um, and what that toxin, that toxin in those seeds does to the human body is it brings on paralysis by overstimulating nerve receptors and then causing the nerve receptors to die. Um, the, and what typically happens is it'll start restricting leg movement. You start getting paralysis in your legs and um, you, um, it, it gets, it, it's progressive. It just keeps getting worse. The more you eat, 
the more you take that toxin in, the worse the paralysis becomes. And um, now it's always been given, it's always been thought in the natural food realm that wild potato is safe to eat all of it, the whole thing, the whole plant. But in fact, that toxin does exist in the seeds. Um, and it, it will affect, especially younger people. Um, the, so the general consensus became that because of his consumption of those seeds, he started becoming weaker and weaker. He couldn't get up and walk. His health kept deteriorating um, that um, because the neurotoxin in that in those seeds um, were breaking him down. And if he had not been eating those seeds, he probably would have been able to walk out of there the end of August and been alive today. But because he got so weak from those toxins, from the seeds, he was no longer able to gather enough food to even sustain himself. As he said in his journal, and I quote again, extremely weak fault of potato seeds. He knew, he knew it was the seeds causing it, probably because he hadn't started eating them right away when he got there. He started eating them later after he had been there. So all the other foods he had been eating anyway, and they didn't make him weaker. They didn't cause any ill effects. But once he started eating potato seeds, he started feeling the effects and they kept getting worse and worse. And I continue the quote, much trouble just to stand up. His legs weren't working anymore like they should. He couldn't stand anymore. And he says, starving, great jeopardy because he knew I could not get out of here. I cannot get out of this situation. And he knew he was starving to death. Um, another thing that he had written was he had written a note um, and he had attached it, he had um, put it in the bus, um, taped it to the door. Um, And this is when they found his body. Um, and the note said, attention possible visitors. SOS, I need your help. I am injured near death and too weak to walk out of here. I am all alone. This is no joke. In the name of God, please rem remain to save me. I am out collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you, Chris McCandless. That's the end of his note. That note was on the door and they found his body in the bus. Now, when they did the autopsy, they found that there was no discernible trace of fat in his body at all. His body had burned up all of his fat reserves, all of it. He, um, let me see if I can find this. Um, the, okay. His driver's license, um, which was issued about eight, six or eight months before he had passed away, um, stated that he was 24 years old and weighed 140 pounds. When they extracted his body, they determined it weighed 67 pounds and it lacked any discernible fat. He literally, over a long period of time, starved to death because it burned all of his body's reserves up. And he was depleting those reserves through his whole stay because he was eating a marginal caloric diet that did not meet the minimum needs he needed to, to 
to live off the land. He thought he was eating. Let's put it that way. He thought that I'm eating. I'm eating squirrels and I'm eating roots and I'm eating berries. I'm eating, so I should be okay. He did not know the food values. He did not know what foods would sustain him, what foods would allow him to live off the land. So he had the right state of mind. He proved that through his hunting and gathering skills. That he had the right state of mind. He knew what he needed to do. He just lacked the knowledge, the technical knowledge of what it takes to live off of those resources. He just was not gathering and hunting enough resources to survive. Now he would have gotten out of there, I believe, alive and probably very ill for a while, but he would have recovered. I don't believe it would have been permanent damage to him. He would have recovered if he had not eaten the wrong food. That was the other failure, was he did not know what he could and could not be consuming. He ate what he thought was a very safe plant. He had a botanical book that showed all the wild plants of the region and that botanical book said that wild potato in its entirety was safe to eat. But at that time, they did not have the information they have today. They did not recognize the fact that the seeds of the potato plant were toxic and could kill you. Cause paralysis. You can't get out. You can't get out and um, gather. You can't get out and hunt. So all you do is sit in your shelter and starve to death. So there you go. Live or die off the land. Those are two cases where people died off the land. Mother Nature, she's tough. She provides everything to those that are in the know. If we don't know, it'll kill us if we try to live strictly off of Mother Nature. She is not gentle when she punishes us for doing the wrong thing out there. So let's keep that in mind as we go through this series. Live or die off the land. I think in the next couple of series, we're going to start getting into some of the um, caloric values, um, some of the other issues that surround living off the land. Um, we'll see where it goes, but we're going to keep going until we cover it all, folks. So there we go. It's kind of a, that was kind of a sad um, video. Um, I never like talking about the failures in the great outdoors, but we need to learn from them. So I hope everybody learned something and feel free, look some of this information up. Um, don't take my word for it. Um, I wanna put you on though probably um, on McCallus. You wanna, uh, uh, McCallus, if you wanna know more about what happened to Chris, um, there's a great little article. It's not a long article, but it's got a lot of information in it and a lot of references. Um, it's with the New Yorker. Um, and I, th I think all you'd have to do is Google Chris McCandless or um, Into the Wild, and you should be able to find it. Um, it's an article with the New Yorker, and um, it was written by um, John... Um, Krakauer, the one who wrote Into the, Into the Wild. So um, it's a very good article. Um, you might want to check that out. But until the next video, this is Stein North saying, hey, make sure to put an extra granola bar in your pack just in case, right?
because you don't want to be up having to eat your hiking partner, right? Until then, you all have a nice day. Bye-bye.